Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started with a few announcements. As you may know, this past week the Governor's Office issued a set of revised guidelines called Healthy Washington. In response to this, the DCC elders have decided to resume group meetings and Sunday in-person church services effective immediately. Our in-person Sunday service will be meeting at 9 a.m. and pre-registration is not needed. We will also continue to provide services online and via DVD. Other groups are also resuming within the guidelines given. If you've been part of a Bible study or support group, check with your group leaders regarding their plans. To kick off the new year, we have two new online programs called Live and Dive. Join Pastor Tim online Thursday mornings for his new live segment appropriately titled Live. He will be sharing up-to-date announcements and happenings at DCC every Thursday at 10 a.m. On Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. will be the Deep Dive. This program will be aired Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Each week, one of our pastors will take us deeper into a subject that has been on their hearts and minds. And finally, we'd like to thank all of you who donated to Advent Conspiracy over the holiday season. Together, we have raised over $40,000 in support of our five local community organizations and Living Water International. This is Darren Sweeney, the youth director here at DCC. I wanted to let everyone know that we will be meeting for youth group in person starting this week. So on Monday nights will be the young adult group. And then on Tuesdays, we'll have middle school youth group from 6 to 7.30 and the high school youth group from 7.45 to 9. So I'm excited to see everyone this week, excited to see your faces, at least from the nose up. And we'll be meeting here in the chapel. And also wanted to let everyone know that the deep dive this week on Thursday night will be an interview with Rob Deku, a dear friend of mine. I had the privilege of being on the support team for him in October when he completed the Uberman, which is the world's toughest triathlon. He was only the seventh person to ever complete this. And so we sat down and talked about the experience, uh, how it went and why he did it. So please join, follow along on Thursday night to see that. And now back to Colleen. And now let's take some time to join together in worship. Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Please join us in worshiping in song. Your love 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. You would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Savior, I come, quiet my 
Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in praise, in worship, and in thanks for your great and amazing love for us, for your mercy that is new every morning. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning, that you would transform our hearts, our minds, our spirits to be more like yours. And we just ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I suppose we all have a certain YouTube artist that we enjoy watching. And one of the guys that I track with some is a guy named Dustin Sandlin. Dustin has a YouTube channel, a program that he calls Smarter Every Day. And I enjoy his programs because, uh, one, they're very interesting and informative. Uh, Dustin also is a believer, um, a, a very smart guy, but a smart guy who loves Jesus Christ. And recently I was watching one of his videos, and uh, as I was thinking about it and thinking about our topic today, I just wanted to share it with you. Um, it's a video about a backwards bicycle. Watch this. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. You know, Dustin has taken that backwards bicycle to conferences all around the country. In fact, I think even some, some other countries in the world and challenged people to try and get on and ride that bicycle. And uh, no one has ever been able to do it unless they practice long enough. Dustin finally got to where he could ride the bike. He said it took him eight months to learn how to do it. Uh, although once he learned how to ride it, he said then he found he couldn't ride a regular bicycle. Uh, if you're interested in that, would like to see the whole story of Dustin and the backwards bicycle, uh, I'm gonna have Shane put a link to that YouTube video in the description for this morning's service. You know, just like the pathways in our minds that, that develop to teach us a skill, our minds also become conformed to our culture as well. We learn how to ride without even giving it a second thought. Breaking out of those kinds of patterns takes a lot of thought. Sometimes you don't even realize all the ways that culture is impacting you until you step into another culture and experience what is often called culture shock. Culture shock affects things big and small, even the way that you sit. I remember being in Cambodia several years ago and learning that showing the sole of your foot to another person is a deeply offensive sign. Well, I can assure you that the Cambodians I was with didn't give a second thought to where the bottoms of their feet were pointing when they were in a group meeting. They just instinctively avoided causing offense. Now, unfortunately, one of my most natural positions when I sit is to cross my legs. And when I do, the bottom of my large 10 and a half D foot often ends up being visible to others in the room. So for me, a simple little thing like where the sole of your foot is pointing became an awkward, self-conscious, even uncomfortable focus every time I sat down. It was one of those backwards bicycle kinds of things. One of the things that Jesus did was introduce his followers to some backwards bicycle ways of thinking. He was actually calling them to a whole new culture, a new kingdom. And life in that kingdom called for new ways of living that challenged so many of their natural ingrained patterns of life. That's a good thing, isn't it? If you've been watching the chaos in our nation this week, isn't it obvious that there has to be something better? 
a different kind of culture, a different way to live? We're going to spend the next few weeks considering the opening section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a section that is often called the Beatitudes. That name comes from a Latin word, Beatitudos, which means a state of blessedness. And that's because each of the phrases in the opening section of the Sermon on the Mount begins with the word blessed. Now, the idea isn't what do we need to do to get God to bless us or how do we get good things from God. Rather, what Jesus was saying is that if these things are true of a person, if they are living life in these ways, then they are in a good place. They are on the path of a good life. They are blessed. But here's the problem. What Jesus says is the good life sounds pretty backwards bicycle to our ears. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take it slow. Now, Dustin said that he spent a little time every day for eight months learning how to ride that bike. We're not going to spend eight months on this series, but I would like you to plug this passage into your heart and mind so that you can meditate on it and start asking God to help rewire the pathways of your mind. So how do we do that? Well, step one would be to memorize. Uh, memorize these first 12 verses of Matthew. They all start with the same word, so you've already memorized a good chunk of it, but to commit that to memory. And then step two, I'd like to invite you to pray and to journal. Uh, maybe find some commentaries that will give you more insight into this passage, but write down your thoughts, write down the things that God is teaching you as you spend time thinking about this opening part to the Sermon on the Mount. The third thing I'd like you to do is to reflect as you move through your day. Take the things that you've memorized and the things that you've written down, the things that you've prayed about, and play them back to yourself as you go through the day. What we're looking for is not just to gain more information, we want to take these things in and as we go through our day, start asking ourselves the question, are these things true of me right now? What I'm doing right here? And then step four is uh, don't quit. It takes some persistence. You are training yourself to ride a backwards bicycle, if you will. And uh, it may not feel natural at first, but it is the culture that God wants us to learn and to adopt if we are his followers. Well, why don't we start by just reading through this section, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Uh, although, before we do that, I have a pet peeve, and it has to do with the word that is spelled B-L-E-S-S-E-D. Now, if you are a Shakespearean actor, you may pronounce this word as blessed. However, for everybody else, it is just blessed. Okay? So, with that bit of housekeeping handled, let's read. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, 
For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let me give you a little bit of background. In Matthew's biography of Jesus, this sermon is the first significant teaching that Jesus gives. If you have one of those red-letter Bibles that highlights the spoken words of Jesus, and you look at the first four chapters of Matthew, you will see that there is very little read there. The first recorded words of Jesus are a single sentence when he asked John the Baptist to baptize him. And then in the wilderness temptation, Matthew records three more one-sentence rebuttals that Jesus gives to Satan. Matthew 4.17 is a really a one-sentence summary of the content of Jesus' teaching. It says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, finally, Matthew records Jesus calling Peter and Andrew to follow him. And again, it's just a single sentence. Now, if you add it all up, it comes to 91 words in the English translation, according to the ESV translation. But, but then suddenly, starting in chapter 5 and continuing all the way through chapter 7, Jesus breaks into full voice preaching. There are three full chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the pages are filled with red print. In fact, I checked in the ESV, that sermon is 2,300 words long. So from only 92 words up to this point, suddenly we have a sermon that's 2,300 words long. I remember when I started college, how all of the freshmen had to show up early for orientation. Stepping into college was really stepping into a whole new world. It was a new culture. And many of us, young students fresh out of high school, were leaving home for the first time. And so the administration wanted to make sure we had a good foundation for understanding how to function and succeed in this new place. That's how I see the Sermon on the Mount. It was Jesus' version of freshman orientation. He's called his disciples to follow him, but they are brand new at this disciple thing. They weren't even totally sure where this guy Jesus is going or what is expected of them. So Jesus takes this freshman class up on a mountain for a little retreat. Now, every public speaker knows that you want to start a lecture with a good introduction, something that really grabs your listeners' attention. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, President Reagan, was known as the great communicator. If you listen to Reagan's speeches, you'll find that he often started with a humorous story or a joke. One story that he told was of a guy who fell off of a cliff. And as the guy was plummeting down, miraculously, he was able to grab hold of a limb that was sticking out of the side of a cliff. And Looking down 300 feet to the canyon floor, he knew that he was in trouble. So, turning his eyes heavenward, he prayed and he said, Lord, give me faith. Tell me what to do. And a voice answered back from the heavens and said, If you have faith, let go. The guy looked down at the canyon floor and he looked back up to heaven and he said, Is there anyone else up there? You know, Jesus, too, wanted to grab the attention of his audience. But instead of humor, he chose paradox. A series of statements that may seem contradictory, upside down, backwards to the way that we normally think. Remember the summary sermon from Matthew 4.17? It said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, to repent means to turn around and go in a different direction. It means to stop doing life the way that we've been doing it. Now, don't forget that Jesus' audience were Jews. These were people that were deeply defined by their religious heritage. Jesus was one of them. 
they were a people who could look back at their history to a time when they'd been a great kingdom, and yet now they were oppressed, vassals of Rome. And they were eagerly desiring God to free them from their oppression and to restore them as a nation. They were looking for a new Moses to lead them out of bondage. And now here comes Jesus, telling them that the kingdom of God lies in the opposite direction from where they're heading. The qualifications for living in the kingdom are completely counterintuitive. Life in the kingdom requires riding a backwards bicycle. Well, now that's an attention grabber. The very first words out of Jesus' mouth are, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? Since we've already established that Jesus is talking about a seemingly backwards culture to be part of his kingdom, let's try inverting this and see if that helps us unravel a bit more of what he means. How about if instead of saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, what if it said instead, blessed are the rich in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? That makes more sense, doesn't it? I, I get that. Blessed are those who have it all together. Blessed are those who are super devout and wear the religion on their sleeve for all to see and admire. Blessed are those who are well studied and highly disciplined in their spiritual pursuits. Blessed are those who bring some things of value to the table, things that God can use for his benefit, for his cause. Blessed are the rich in spirit. Those are the folks that God wants in his kingdom. Well, there certainly were people in Jesus' time who filled that bill. There were established groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were the religion pros of the day. They dressed different from other people. They were very strict about their lifestyle. They studied intensely. They kept themselves separate from the lower elements of society. In fact, they criticized Jesus for hanging around with the wrong people. They held places of high social honor and, and real political power. So if God were going to set up a new kingdom, they were the most natural people to be placed in charge. But that is not what Jesus said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. By singling out the poor in spirit, Jesus effectively bypassed the ones that seemed most qualified. It's almost like he took a stack of resumes, sorted through them uh, from most to least qualified, like any good HR director would, and then flipped the whole pile over, grabbed the one from the bottom and said, I'll hire him. Have you ever been physically poor? It's tough duty. You look at your bank account and you realize that there is nothing much to look at. It means that life is filled with uncertainty as you ask the most basic questions. What will I eat? Where will I sleep? How will I care for my children? Being poor means being dependent on others. You hope that they'll give you a job. Maybe they'll donate some food or some clothes. Maybe they'll let you crash on their couch. It's socially humbling. When you're poor and you walk into the room, people may not notice you because you don't have much to offer in this world's goods. So what does spiritual poverty look like? Well, the spiritually poor person has looked at their own spiritual resources and has realized there isn't much there. They recognize their mixed motives for what they are. They've taken an honest appraisal of their life as a whole and not just the public persona that they project 
the, the one that they groom for display on Facebook or Instagram. No, they know about the real them. The real them that struggles with petty jealousies, anger, greed, lust, selfishness, and the list goes on. But they also long for something more. They long to know God, to be useful to Him, to know His love. They just know that if entering His kingdom depends on their spiritual accomplishments, their worthiness, well, there isn't enough loose change in their pockets to even come close to buying a ticket for the nosebleed seats in God's kingdom. And yet here suddenly is Jesus saying that their poverty is their ticket in. How could that be? If you look through the scriptures, you will see this theme of spiritual poverty and God's favor showing up all over the place. You can go right back to the Garden of Eden where we find Adam and Eve having done the one thing God told them not to do and then trying to hide their nakedness behind fragile leaves. Even beggars usually have more than just leaves to work with. And so what does God do? Well, he provides garments of animal skin for them. An early indication that God is both merciful and the one who alone can meet our deepest needs. Or think about King David, who knew well the shame of sin and failure, but who also longed to be God's man. He wrote these words in Psalm 40, verse 17. I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Or how about this passage from Isaiah? Isaiah the prophet said this in Isaiah 41. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I mentioned a few weeks ago a parable that Jesus told specifically to address people who thought that they were spiritually rich. The story is about a self-righteous Pharisee and a shame-filled tax collector who went up to the temple to pray. And you recall that the Pharisee proudly proclaimed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. This guy was pretty proud of his spiritual accomplishments, and he wanted to be sure that God knew what a great deal he was getting by having him in his kingdom. Well, the tax collector had nothing to boast about. It says that he stood far off, wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus said that of those two, it was the tax collector whose prayer was heard and honored by God. In Revelation chapter 3, the Apostle John delivers a warning from the Lord to a Christian church. It's the church at Laodicea. Now, these were people who had started their faith journey laying hold of God's grace. In fact, if you read the letter to the Colossians, you'll see that Paul refers to them favorably. They started well. But somewhere along the line, they had become self-possessed. Here's the warning to them in Revelation. You say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, 
and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You think you're rich, but you're really poor. So what about this promise that the poor, those poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When do we get that? Well, I think it is both now and not yet. People who have taken honest stock of themselves, who have given up their pride, come with an open heart to Jesus and truly hunger for more of him, are people who will experience a different kind of life in the here and now. They will experience relationships characterized by a truer kind of love. They'll find themselves moved to acts of generosity and self-sacrificing love that will bless others. They will both bring and experience glimmers of heaven right here and now. I love an image that Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Isn't that a great image? Paul says that because of Christ in our lives, if we are following him, we live a different way and we actually are lights in the world. We should shine out with a difference that matters here and now. So Paul says that here and now, still in the middle of a crooked, twisted world, we're making a difference. And yet we are still in the middle of a crooked, twisted world. The full realization of God's kingdom is not yet. We watch and wait. The promise is that one day Christ will come and will set all things right. When he does, it will not be the self-assured who find his favor, but those who have come humbly seeking grace. Theirs is the kingdom. So what is the takeaway? Maybe for you, Christianity is something that you've held at arm's length. And if so, I want to congratulate you for hanging in there with me this far. Perhaps one of the things that has been keeping you at a distance is the way you've seen people who claim to be Christians behave. You've seen hypocrisy. Maybe you've been burned by someone who claimed they followed Jesus, but somehow that didn't seem to improve their business ethics. You've been put off by people that were self-righteous and judgmental. If that's been your experience, I am so sorry. That is not the way of Jesus. Those of us that have chosen to follow him have been called to ride this backwards bicycle. And frankly, we fall down a lot. Some of us even decide to go back and ride the old bicycle. We just put a Jesus sticker on it, and that just makes everything super confusing. So whether the Christians you know are living this well or lousy, the real question is, what will you do? Jesus started his ministry by looking specific people in the eye and asking them to follow him. That is his question to each one of us. Will I, will you follow him? Now, if you're really honest with yourself, you may say, I'm not good enough to do that. I'm certainly not good enough to do that. If that's you, then I'd say that uh, this is the perfect answer. Uh, that's part of what it means to be poor in spirit. To know that in yourself, you don't have what it takes. But here's the good news. Jesus set the bar pretty low for entering his kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If that's you, then you're in a good place. When we invite Jesus to take charge of our lives, he begins to change us. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that's why he is often called the Savior. 
He saves us because we can't save ourselves. When I was 12 years old, I uh, almost drowned in a pool. When I first got in trouble, I didn't want to admit it, and I tried to save myself. I started thrashing the water, but the edge was just too far away. You know what saved me? It's a lifeguard. He was my savior in that pool. But I had to cry out for help. That's probably what you need to do too. Tell Jesus that you need him. You don't need any fancy words or special formulas. You don't even have to close your eyes or fold your hands. Just honestly ask him to save you. If you pray that prayer, or if you just have prayed that prayer, or, or you have questions, would you contact us? We would be honored to talk with you about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, for many of us, we've already called out for that Savior, and we jumped on that backwards bicycle, and God truly turned our lives around. But the problem is, the world around and our own inclinations keep tempting us to ride the other way. Go with the flow. It's just so natural. God changes us and we begin to live better. And then if we're not careful, we get proud about how much better we are. We love the family of faith, but over time we begin to see the world as us versus them. We start feeling superior to others. We get self-righteous. And if those things take hold and we become self-satisfied, we also become blind to ourselves. Did you notice in that warning to the church at Laodicea that the Lord told them they needed to buy medicine for their eyes because they had become blind? Being poor in spirit isn't just an entry requirement for God's kingdom. It is a daily realization that keeps us honest, humble, and dependent. John Stott, commenting on the church of Laodicea, says this, This visible church, for all its Christian profession, was not truly Christian at all. Self-satisfied and superficial, it was composed, according to Jesus, of blind and naked beggars. But the tragedy was that they would not admit it. They were rich, not poor, in spirit. So how is your spirit? Proud or poor? Now that's a conversation that you and God are going to have to have one-on-one. -on -one. And it may take some slow self-reflection. It's a little scary because most of us want to feel better, not worse about ourselves. But don't shy away. The point isn't how bad you feel about yourself. No, it's about how much you realize you need him. And in that realization, how much hunger you have for more of him in your life. Not because you deserve him, but because you long to be like him. The old commentator, Matthew Henry, described the poor in spirit like this. They see their want, bewail their guilt, and thirst after a redeemer. The kingdom of grace is of such. The kingdom of glory is for them. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Please join us in singing a closing song. Searching 
Well, good morning. I'm Sean Stanton. Thank you for being here today. Hey, a show of hands. How many of you are striving to be poor? Probably none of you. The rich don't want to be poor. The poor don't want to be poor. In fact, I don't think there is any form of poverty that's desirable. However, we saw today in the first beatitude that Jesus had a very different perspective on being poor. In contrast to the religious elite of his day, the Pharisees, he wanted us and his audience at that time to recognize and feel a very deep sense of spiritual destitution and to understand the need for God and his grace. A quote I came up or I found this week that I thought was really good for this. It said, there must be emptiness before there can be fullness. And so poverty of spirit precedes riches and grace in the kingdom of God. Okay, our first question for the day for discussion or reflection. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Discuss the time when you first realized your spiritual poverty. How is God fulfilling your spiritual needs today? And then the last one, how do you enjoy the blessings of the kingdom of heaven now, even while on earth? Okay, so that's our questions for today. I hope you have a great time. I hope many of you have been able to start gathering again in your homes. And uh, yeah, God bless you, and I will see you next week.